John. Come on in. This is our wonderful Cultural Affairs Department Poetry Center. Can you believe that we do all this work and produce all this stuff out of this office? Sometimes I can't myself. T.J. Nike is the secretary, and our wonderful, invaluable secretary, without whom we couldn't really run the office. Lori Ratner is our gallery curator and Young People's Theater Development Coordinator. This is Aline Papazian's desk, however, this is her day off. We run the office all with part-time people, so. And Susan Amsterdam sits there. Diani Fletcher over there. We don't have any of our people. They're all gone. They're having cigarette breaks or something. I don't know. <laughs> Come on in, and we'll have a little conversation. I think poetry has uh, come a very long way in, in the past 20 years. Um, and by that I mean that when I was growing up, uh, poetry was taught and presented in the classroom as something that was intimidating, something to be um, explained and uh, that ordinary people couldn't understand it without a lot of explanation. I happen to have loved poetry from the time that I was a little girl and we did have to memorize poems and I love the sound of the poems even when I didn't understand them I loved the way they sounded and they seemed to speak to me very directly and I very quickly began finding poets whose words seemed to speak to me. Uh, but I think for a lot of people of my generation, uh, they were frightened away by poetry because it was presented as something that an ordinary person couldn't understand that it was an elitist kind of thing. And then in the last 20 years, I think there's been a turnaround on that. And I think that with the growth of performance poetry, with a movement for, it started actually, I think, by Allen Ginsberg, um, but going back to, uh, to Whitman, I think that there's been a movement for um, toward a more simplicity in poetry, more detail, more detail of ordinary life, things that people could directly relate to in poetry. In the last couple of years, what I've seen is a backlash against that. Um, I think that the anthology that my daughter and I did, that Jennifer um, and I did, called Unsettling America has been very successful because we deliberately chose poems that were very clear, very direct, very much about human experience, uh, very much about everyday life, spoken about in a very clear and we hope beautiful and moving way. Uh, and because of that, the book is in its sixth printing. I think that's pretty amazing for um, an anthology. But I think that in the last couple of years there's been a backlash against that kind of poetry and I think that I almost imagine five white guys from Harvard sitting at a table saying, wait a minute, who are all these people, these African Americans and Native Americans and um, Hispanics and Latinos and Italians and um, people, outsider people, who are suddenly getting heard in American poetry and suddenly getting a foothold in American poetry. So I imagine them sitting there deciding we're going to close the doors on this. We can't have this. So we're suddenly seeing articles about how poetry has to be unclear, how poetry has to be, um, the poetry has always been for the elite. It's always been for a few people. Poetry books have never sold. And yet a poet like Hal Searowitz, for example, um, has a book that was published by a major publisher. It's called Mother Said. And in that book, he very clearly speaks about his mother, uses dialogue to promote the poem. And, uh, and, and to, uh, to build the poem. And what he's done is he sold 22,000 copies of that book in the first three months in hardcover. And he has another book coming out. He has, uh, the, uh, they're not even doing a paperback edition. He sold so many copies of the book at this point after two years that they're not even doing a, a, a paperback version of it. They're going to continue to sell it in hardback. Um, and usually the hardback version is a very small printing and then the paperback version is the one that they make a lot of copies of. This has not been true with him. And I think if poetry speaks directly and clearly about human life in a way that's available to everybody, just as Shakespeare really spoke to everybody. Shakespeare really spoke to the people in the pit as well as the people 
who are more elite. And it, I, when it does that, I think poetry does sell. I think poetry is, the poetry audience, at least our poetry audience, has been growing. Um, in New Jersey, we have the Geraldine R. Dodge Poetry Festival. That has brought, last, last year or the year before, I can't remember what, what year it was, but in any case, the last poetry festival, they had so many people come to the poetry festival on Saturday of the four-day festival that they had to close it. They had to turn them away. The police wouldn't let them bring anybody else in. And that's a huge Waterloo Village in Stanhope is a huge facility. But they would not allow them to have any more people in there. So they had to actually close the place. I think that there have been films on poetry that have been very popular. I think the Bill Moyers, the Language of Life program. I think Jim Haba from the Dodge Foundation and Scott McVeigh have both really supported poetry. And I think that there's a, a real resurgence of interest in poetry. And then on the other hand, you have the five white guys from Harvard saying, wait a minute, let's make it elite again. And they really do have a great deal of power. It's frightening. But I think if people keep saying, the reason we are not buying that kind of poetry is because that's not the kind of poetry that we want to read. Uh, if people stop giving the prizes to the kind of poetry that is basically all mind and no heart, then maybe we have a chance of having poetry survive. And I think it will, because I think that there is a real movement that can't be stopped by five guys in white robes. It won't be stopped. Not if I have anything to do, do with it. And I think that there are a number of other people in this country who feel the same way. There's something to be said. There are stories to be told. And we need to listen. I'm going to start with some new poems. Um, I've, I've suddenly had a spurt of writing energy. And um, that seems to be coming, in a way, from uh, my life in Patterson. I want to start with a few of these poems. Uh, and this poem is called, it's a prose poem, and it's called, Why I Write. I write for the people who lived in the Riverside section of Patterson, New Jersey, for all the people who never learned the words to tell their own stories. I write for Johnny Marici, his 14-hour days in his grocery store, for Yahoo, the schizophrenic city cowboy who shouted and laughed on street corners, for skinny old Philomena in her black dress, for the beautiful blonde woman from 17th Street with the two young children whose husband was electrocuted in the silk mill one day, and they came home to tell her, and for all the years of her young life she spent raising those children alone. And for Mr. Cuccinello and his sad, sweet face and his movies in the backyard all summer. And for all the neighborhood kids. And for Ziwa Yelmo, who always seemed so lost. And for Zee Luisa and for sleazy Joey Fuccello and his hours goofing off in front of the candy store. And for all the others, Amalia, Pepina, Melba, Linda, Joe, their voices loud and insistent in my head until I shaped their lives onto clean white paper, and then, at last, they are still. And I'm going to read a poem because I'm wearing my, my lucky dress. I'm going to read a poem called My Lucky Dress. Ever since I was a little girl, I thought that I had lucky clothes and unlucky ones. Lucky clothes were clothes that I wore when good things happened. I won a prize in school. A teacher praised my work. I got an A, a boy I liked talked to me. Unlucky clothes were the clothes I wore when something bad happened. If I wore a certain blouse once, and that was the day that the girls in seventh grade excluded me from their club, or I didn't know an answer to a question, then I was afraid to wear that blouse again. I'd like to say I've outgrown my superstitions, but I haven't. I still have lucky clothes and unlucky ones, so I give a lot of clothes away to the Salvation Army, and I've come to believe in my instincts since, like my mother before me, I have a form of ESP. I can tell immediately when I am near a person who is mean-spirited or vengeful or jealous. 
Once when we went to see a house we were thinking of buying, my mother came with us to see it. And as soon as she entered the front hall, my mother became very agitated, saying, let's get out, let's get out. This house has evil spirits in it. We thought she had lost her mind and laughed at her, but later found out that three people had been murdered in that house. So when she had one of her moments, we were inclined to listen rather than to laugh. I guess you could say it's the peasant in me, this belief that I can tell when something is about to happen or know that a particular friend will call me two minutes before the phone rings. But I have learned to listen to that voice that whispers inside me. <clears throat> if I don't, I always regret it. So now, if you see me wearing a long black dress and a pink and green scarf with fringe on it, and a jacket with marcasite pins on it from a thrift store. You'll know I wear this outfit a lot because it's my lucky dress. I suppose people are sick of seeing me in it at poetry readings, but I still need to wear it. A talisman that will ward off all the malevolent spirits that hover, <clears throat> excuse me, all the malevolent spirits that hover in the room around us, especially at the moments when we want so much to be brilliant and charming and love. And, you know, I realized that I said that it was five white guys from Harvard who controlled the poetry scene and the, who wanted to keep poetry as a kind of elitist thing. And I think I have to clarify this, especially since my nephew goes to Harvard, he won't be too appreciative, uh, but also because it's not Harvard, but rather a Harvard as a representative of a kind of upper class, um, Ivy League, uh, privileged group of people, and who want to keep control over what gets into the Norton Anthology, what gets into the, the major anthologies of uh, poetry, what goes into the literary canon. And it certainly isn't only Harvard. Um, it's a good number of institutions in this country who tend to promote work by people like themselves. And so anybody who threatens that, a woman who does not like write, write like a man, um, an African-American, uh, they're willing to put in one or two, mostly unthreatening ones. Um, but there are lots of voices in this country at this point. It's a really diverse country and a wonderful country because of this diversity. And I think that we have to try to keep promoting the poetry of inclusion. And I don't mean it as a kind of affirmative action for poetry. I mean it as a reflection of what the country is. The country is no longer a white Anglo-Saxon country. And while the idea of the melting pot may have been wonderful, it was also a way of erasing a lot of people and making a good number of people in the country feel that they did not belong, that they, in order to belong, they had to become this thing that was not themselves. And I think one of the things that poetry does is it builds bridges between people. It allows people to speak to one another about their experience. And I think that's very important if the country is to grow stronger. It's very important that we include everyone and that we try to understand each other on a human level. So I'm certainly not singling out Harvard, but Harvard as a symbol of a kind of Ivy League privileged upper class um, institution, um, uh, which I certainly would have loved to have attended if they would have had me, which they certainly would not. I'm going to read a poem, since we're talking about clothes and self-image, I want to read a poem called My Son Tells Me Not to Wear My Poet's Clothes. My son tells me not to wear my poet's clothes. They're weird, he says. He wants me to look like an old-fashioned grandmother, someone out of an L.L. Bean catalog in a preppy sweater and a corduroy skirt, the kind of clothes that would have been all wrong for me even when I was 20 years old and 104 pounds. I love thin, flowery dresses that float around me when I walk, long, colorful scarves with fringe on them. 
My son does not say it out loud, but I know he thinks I'm the wrong kind of mother and that I should act my age and give up my poetry because it's strange for me to be running off to all those poetry readings and giving workshops and working so many hours a week at my job. Sometimes I think we should trade places. He could be the staid conservative mother and I the recalcitrant son. When we talk on the phone, I hear how he shoulders the responsibilities of his life, his wife, his children, his job, the house, the yard. John, I say, you're only 31. Give yourself a break. I hear him sigh, that expelled breath fraught with meaning that is the sound I make when I am anxious or bored, and I am saddened when I hear it coming from him over the wires across all that distance. Not only the landscape that separates us, but the language that fails us. So I cannot find a way to make him understand that I love him, this son who needs to be far away from me. So that, so that it's as though I am chasing him down a path, but he's always faster than me. I see him sitting with his son, Jackson, in his arms. Jackson, who looks just like John did at two. I see the way they lean together, Jackson so relaxed and trusting, his ear pressed to his father's heart. So I'm writing a lot of poems that sort of look like that, which means that they're I'm calling them prose poems, but I don't know if they're part of a memoir or what they are exactly. I'm just really happy to be writing. In the stacks of the Patterson Public Library. When I was 14, I asked my father to help me get a job. So he called the mayor and asked him for help in getting me a job. My father was a wonderful orator, was always invited to speak at all the Italian societies. He had worked very hard to get out the vote, so the mayor owed him a favor. When my father said I wanted a job in the Patterson Public Library, the mayor said, but that pays only 50 cents an hour. My father told me, and I said I still wanted to work in the library. I love to read, love the branch library, love the feel of a book in my hands. So I went off to the public library where I was told to speak to Miss Cherry, supervisor of circulation. I went there after school, walked from Eastside High to the imposing white column library through the marble hall with its curving stair and bronze statues and oil paintings donated by the wealthy old families of the city. Miss Cherry gave me a sour look, sniffed and told me quickly what to do. But I knew she wasn't happy that I had been palmed off on her and she let me know she didn't like it. Another young woman started the same day, a tall, beautiful, light-skinned African-American who came from an upper-middle-class family. Her father owned a funeral home. She had expensive clothes and straight hair. I know we didn't call blacks African-Americans then. This was 1954. Did we call them Negroes? I can't remember. I only know I liked her. We both loved books and we liked to talk to each other in the stacks. She knew Miss Cherry hated us both, but this girl, her name was Anthea, she was more articulate and confident than I was. I was incredibly shy and tongue-tied, but she'd answer Miss Cherry back or give her a look that would shut her up immediately. And then Miss Cher Cherry would scowl at me and find something wrong with what I'd done and yell and tears would fill my eyes. Never let her see you cry, Anthea said. It just makes her happy. Anthea told me that Miss Cherry, who came from one of the old families of Virginia, thought she should step off the sidewalk when she went by, the way the Negroes did in the South when a white person walked toward them. Despite Miss Cherry, I liked the job, carrying the books up into the stacks on the translucent, thick glass stairs, five floors of stacks lined with books, and I'd rush up the stairs and shelve the books so I could read for five or ten minutes one of the poetry books, Amy Lowell, Edna St. Vincent Millay, Eleanor Wiley, E. Cummings, light cascading through the stacks, through the transparent floors, and onto the poems that soared inside of me, the words seeming to take wing against everything gray and ordinary in my life.
One day, Miss Cherry accused me of stealing a book of Shakespeare because it was missing from where it belonged. And suddenly, all my outrage at the way she treated me, the disdainful way she always spoke to me, rose up in a storm of rage and shy mouse of a girl. I turned on her, my eyes flashing fire. My voice rose so everyone in the library heard, and I said, I do not steal books, and don't ever accuse me of doing something like that again. My shoulders flung back, my eyes saying if she didn't take it back, I'd slug her. She said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, of course you didn't. I don't know what I was thinking. And Anthea, standing behind us, flashed me a huge victory grin. I would like to say that the exter external image of a poet is not important, but I know that that's not true. Um, I, I'd like to say that it doesn't make any difference, but I know that's not true. As with any other medium in which part of the medium is performance, then the way you look is really important. Um, for me, the only thing I can hope is that my poetry is in essence seamless in the sense that it's the same as what I am and the same as my external appearance. Um, I, I am not 20 years old. I am not um, a, a woman with uh, very dramatic looks. Um, I, I think that in a way everything about my poetry sort of fits with what I look like and uh, that's about all I can do. I, can, I, I can't be something that I'm not and I can't be something that I'm not in the poems and I can't be something that I'm not in the performance. And I just have to hope that in a way the poems transform me. I certainly hope so. And I hope that when they're read on the page that what, what I look like has nothing to do with it. Uh, once I remember reading with um, a woman who was very beautiful. She was about 70 pounds soaking wet and she got up and she had this red gold hair and she kept doing this through the whole reading. You know, and she was really gorgeous. Unfortunately, her poetry was really lacking in anything that would be memorable. It was imitation, I would call it, it was animal poems. It was imitation um, uh, D.H. Lawrence, sort of, that's what it reminded me of. And, but the whole time that she was standing up there, she was just doing this and looking so thin and, and wonderful that I, every insecurity I've ever had in my life came out and every fear I've ever had about myself surfaced and it was really quite a disconcerting and then I got up to read my poems and suddenly I thought well you know I don't know I know I don't look like her but people were crying and uh, my son who was in the audience bolted for the back of the room I was reading at a college and he bolted for the back of the room and went out into the hall and said I'll never come to a reading of yours again you made me cry and um, so it didn't matter. I mean, it would be nice to be beautiful, um, but maybe there are different kinds of beauty. And if I had to choose between being beautiful and being able to write, I would rather write. Uh, if, if I had to choose between being beautiful and, or if I could choose between being beautiful and being able to have people write me letters about my poems, I would always take the letters. Every minute. It's worth it. So. That's sort of the way I feel about it. But I will read a poem called The Black Bear on My Neighbor's Lawn in New Jersey. In my neighbor's front yard, where one birch tree casts its pale shadow over their small suburban ranch house, and the grass is smooth and freshly mowed, an enormous black plastic bear stands, its paws upraised as though ready to attack its mouth stretched in a senseless grin. Every year, my neighbors have a garage sale to get rid of all the knickknacks and fake country plaques and costume jewelry and mugs with cutesy sayings on them that they've accumulated during the year. Next year, maybe they'll try to sell the fake bear with its weird, cockeyed smile. And maybe they'll even find someone like themselves to buy it one more accumulation in a life of acquisitions. Think of it, 
This plastic bear doesn't need the wilderness to live. It doesn't need food. 200,000 years from now, if we let the world survive that long, the people of the future will find it. Imagine how confused they'll be as they try to figure out what use we could have made of it, what kind of lives we led. This poem is called Learning to Sing. I am in this hallway of the 19th Street house. The front door is a double door, one side always kept locked. The other side opens when you turn a deadbolt. The door is painted dark, dark brown, a color that is also used for the floor, the banisters and stairs to the upstairs apartment, the door to our apartment. Usually we use the back door into the kitchen, but today I've gone out to get the mail and see a letter for me. I stand in the hallway to open the letter, which looks official and is embossed with a return address that says Seton Hall University. The letter is addressed to me. The letter tells me I have been awarded a full four-year scholarship to Seton Hall University in Patterson, and this scholarship covers four full years of tuition. I shout for my mother. I'm excited to have won the award. We make so much noise in the hallway that the people upstairs look down to find out what happened. <clears throat> Suddenly, with my family around me, I realize I will have to take this scholarship, that I won't be going to the University of Virginia as I had hoped with its colonnades and old brick and ivy. I had imagined it, though I had not been out of Patterson more than three times in my life and had no idea what the University of Virginia represented the kind of people who went there, the way I would have been awkward and out of place. At least I will not have to go to William Patterson College to major in kindergarten or first grade teaching as my mother would like. Instead, I can go to Seton Hall, major in English, dream of becoming a writer. Though when I announce my ambition, my cousin Joey, who is an accountant, says it's the most impractical thing he's ever heard. My mother used to say, your fate waits behind the door. You cannot see it, but it is there. In the hallway, behind that brown door, my fate came to me to stay in Patterson, even to go to college a few blocks from Eastside High School, to absorb the feel of the city for four more years, to carry the voice of its people, my people, in my head, to hear their stories and save them to tell. The voices that rise in my head now, insistent, wanting to be heard, to tell their stories though they never could have told them themselves, never have found the words to tell them, and in my stories I save them, these people who are so much a part of my life, their voices caught like music in my mind. I had to cry a long time before I could learn to sing their songs as well as my own. Um, I think that in a lot of my poems I talk about silence and I talk about um, uh, speaking. And I think both things were very important to me because when I was growing up, I was afraid to talk. I was afraid to say anything. I, I really was so inarticulate when I was growing up. Not that I didn't have words that I used when I was writing, because I did, but I couldn't speak out. and. It took me so long to get to the point where I would have the courage to say what I meant and say what I felt. And I think probably that's very true for many women of my generation. It may be true of many people, but um, it certainly was true of women of my generation. And when I see myself, I see myself almost as mute. And it, it's, and then by comparison, I'm sure anyone who knows me today says, this is impossible. This woman could never have been mute. Uh, but I'm making up for lost time. Anyway, I want to read a poem uh, called The Ghost in Our Bed, and it's a poem for my husband uh, who has early onset Parkinson's disease, and I don't know if um, anybody knows what that is, but basically it's a disease that causes um, uh, short-term memory loss and um, difficulty in movement, um, stiffness and inability to move quickly and um, muscle pain. The ghosts in our bed. The mahogany four-poster bed your mother left us is high up off the floor. It folds us into the smell of lavender and sheets sprinkled with violets, the thick blue and green comforter. 
For years we are happy in it, lusty and young, and so alive together. This safe place to which we return each night to lie in each other's arms, warm and exactly where we want to be. Now when we climb into our bed, those people who for so many years were ourselves, the ghosts that we live with, sleep between us. You have become so fragile, you are always cold and need extra blankets, and you sleep so quietly, your arms folded across your chest, that when I wake up in the night, I have to reach out to find you, because I'm not certain you're there. You used to take up so much space with your energy and strength, the big bones of your body. I pile blankets on you now, your face rigid and frozen, even in sleep. The ghosts of the future hover over us, reminding us every night of how much more we have to lose, even as our old ghosts whisper, remember, remember. I fall asleep with my hand on your shoulder to keep you with me as long as I can. So I think life teaches us a great deal more than we want to know sometimes, and that we can never, looking into the future, we, we never are we just don't know what's going to happen to us. And my mother's right, the future is behind the door, your fate is behind the door. So you really can't see it, but it's there waiting for you. And um, in a way, when you live your life, you discover what's important to you, what you're willing to stand up for, um, what you're going to do with your life, how that life is going to have some meaning. Um, it's a it's a process it's it's a very long process and in a way it's like writing poetry because i think that for me writing poetry is and i try to tell this to my students as well that in a way it's as though poems hide in a very deep place inside you and that place is guarded by a crow and the crow says you know you can't say that you're not allowed to say that you're not allowed to feel that you can't write that down uh, it's the, it has in it the voice of every teacher who's ever yelled at you, every authority figure who's ever threatened or, or been threatening toward you. Um, and and we really, in order to do anything in our lives and in our writing, we have to get rid of the crow. We get rid of the crow, we're able then to reach all the things that are important to us in our lives. So I have the feeling that somewhere very deep inside us is this cave, and in the cave are all the words we need to say, all the stories we need to tell, all the things that we're afraid of, all the things about ourselves that we're afraid of. Um, all the insecurities that we have, because I don't care if you start out with insecurities, you're probably going to have them for a long time. You can overcome some of them, but I know for myself that frightened little girl reappears every once in a while. Just when I think I've lost her, there she is again. And I think that's probably true for many of us. We don't know what's going to happen in our lives. We don't know where we're going, but we keep, we keep moving forward and trying to discover where we're going. In a way, that's what writing poetry is like, trying to find out where we're going and we don't know. Sometimes until a poem is finished, we don't know where the poem is going because it's coming out of a very deep place in ourselves, a place where I think there's a, m a more primitive part of ourselves lives, but also a more highly developed part, the part that knows things that we don't know in our conscious minds, but that is so attuned to the world around us that it's as though it's telling us, and we damn well better listen. Oh, we better listen. And uh, so I want to read a poem called, I want to say, and I don't know if this is a good poem or a bad poem or any, any but it really does deal with this sort of insecurity. I want to say all the things I wish I had known to say when I was younger. Think of all the times I sat tongue-tied and still in those gray public school classrooms with their dusty blackboards. The teacher would ask questions and I'd be fr afraid to answer, to raise my hand wanting to do it, wanting to give the answer, to stand up next to my brown scarred desk, my saddle shoes inexpertly polished with white polish that ran over the edges of the black sections of the shoe, my socks falling down and crumpled looking, stand up straight, my face white and terrified, my eyes large and almost startled with fear, and give the answer in a clear voice. But of course I never did. 
never raised my hand, never found the words to give the answer. Instead, I hovered at the fringes of groups, drinking, drinking in the words of the others, the stories and laughter, remembering it all clearly even now, 40 years later, remembering how much I wanted to speak and how I couldn't make myself say, say anything and how, even today, that timid child still leaps into my throat sometimes at art receptions or big parties, still makes me feel as inarticulate as I was then, my insides trembling with insecurity. The child appears as she did when I read at Trinity College in Hartford, all those Ivy League professors and those upper class students, all those flat chested women in tweed jackets, and me trembling and feeling lower class in my flowers dress oh I think we do and I think that it's not a question of gender it's a it's uh, I'm writing out of a perspective as a woman I mean I, I have to write out of that perspective because that's what I am <clears throat> and I have to write out of the perspective of being an Italian American woman because that's what I am and uh, because I grew up in Patterson I have to write about that because my work at least some some people write work that has no connection with their lives I write poems, and that's why my book is called Where I Come From, <laughs> because basically my, my work is very rooted in place. It's very rooted in Patterson. It's very rooted in this particular landscape, in these particular people, in the people I knew as I was growing up, um, in memory. Um, for me, that's where my work comes from. And But I can't, I can't ever escape from writing from the perspective of a woman, but I hope that in writing about my experiences growing up here in Patterson, that my work will transcend that and reach out to other people who had similar experiences, because there are lots of experiences that we all have that are that, that really are human experiences. And I remember I was on, on National Public Radio once, and the first phone call came from a black man who said, I didn't know white people felt that, felt the way black people do. Because I think that's the way a lot of us are. We think, oh, well, you know, I'm a woman, I'm the only person who feels this way. Or I'm Italian-American, or I'm black, or I'm Hispanic, and I'm the only person who feels this way. And we don't realize the kind of connections there are. I think the great thing about poetry is that it makes those sorts of connections, that it gives us that ability to bridge the gaps between male and female, experience between city and, and rural experience. Because really what I'm writing about, I hope, is about being human, about growing up, about the kind of things that happened to me when I was growing up, um, about, I'd like to read a poem about my mother. I, I, my mother died five years ago, and I really would like to read a poem about her because um, she was so big a part of, of my life. Um, that it, it just seems to me that I couldn't possibly do this without, without reading a poem about her. And she was one of these women who was extremely strong. Um, she was small, but very strong, and very strong physically and very strong emotionally and mentally. Uh, she thought that there was nothing that she, she really felt she could do anything. And in fact, one day she went out and she knocked the front steps down and rebuilt them because she had seen the mason across the street do it. And she figured if he could do it, she could. And when she finished, she said it was like icing a cake. <laughs> I thought it was, I'll never forget it. And the steps are beginning to crumble now, and that's about 30 years ago. Anyway, one time she told me she had forgotten how to cry. This poem is for her. Ma, who told me <clears throat> you forgot how to cry. Soothsayer, healer, tale teller, there was nothing you could not do. In your basement kitchen with the cracked brown and yellow tiles, the sink on metal legs, the big iron stove with its pot simmering, the old calvinator from 1950, the metal kitchen table and plastic chairs. I'd watch you roll out dough for pastigelle, be quiet, you'd say, and work at super speed. Today, when we walk into your hospital room, you do not speak of your illness. Do not mention the doctor who tells you bluntly you have three months at most to live. Your shrewd, sharp eyes watch us, but you do not cry. Soothsayer, healer, tale teller, always ready with a laugh and a story, ready to offer coffee, cakes, advice at your oval kitchen table, your chair pulled close and your hands always full. 
We are like little children gathered around your bed, Al with his doctor's bag full of tricks and medicine. Laura in her nurse's uniform, her hands twisting, and me, my head full of words that here in this antiseptic room are no use, no use at all. We wait for you to get up out of that bed to start bossing us around the way you always did. Tell us a story with a happy ending, one in which the oil of Santo Rocco that you rub on your swollen belly each night works its elusive miracle. Soothsayer, healer, tale teller, there was nothing you could not do. What about this dangerous woman poem? Oh, uh, gosh, I wish I could find it. I seem to have lost it. Just a minute, John. Could we turn this off a second so I can blow my nose? <laughs> I can't believe I can't find it. It's so annoying. And it's because I have the wrong folder. I have the prose stuff, mostly. It's very annoying, I must say. Uh... Well, I guess what are you going to do? I suppose I'm stuck. I'm not going to be able to find it. And Oh, here it is. Okay. We're set with the dangerous woman poem. Um, I was on the... Can I talk? Yes or no? Yes. Um, I wrote this poem when I was out at Naropa in the summer. Um, I, taught, I taught at Naropa Institute in Boulder, Colorado this summer, and I was on a panel and I was so upset by some of the things that were said by the panelists. Um, and so unwilling, I knew politically it would have been a good idea to be quiet and not say anything, but I just couldn't do it. And then when I went back to uh, my room, they had put us up in a motel near the near the campus um, I wrote this poem and for the first time I never read a new poem that I've just written but I gave a reading that Saturday night and I read this poem at, at the reading I just I don't know if it's a good poem or a bad poem but it sure expressed what I felt and it's called on becoming a dangerous woman once I was a good little girl, silent, solemn, my large eyes terrified. I sat with my hands folded on the top of my desk as our teacher instructed, tried to be perfect and good to make the teacher like me, tried to make my friends like me by rushing to agree with whatever they said, tried to make boyfriends like me by being so willing to please, tried to be the perfect wife who always put my husband first, meek and mild as a lamb. I gave up, gave in, did whatever it took to keep him from shouting and banging his fist against the wall, juggled the house, the children, my job, so that everything would run smoothly, and I didn't complain when I was the one who had to pick up the kids from track meets and plays and parties. I never complained, said, oh no, I don't mind, I don't mind, when someone said, you don't mind going first, do you? You don't mind helping me out, picking me up, taking me home, going to the store for me. Oh no, I don't mind, until one day an electrical current surged through me, erased all my please, sorry, sorry. I said, no, I can't do that. I said, will you help me? I said, I think, and I didn't let anyone interrupt. I'm a dangerous woman. I'm not afraid of anyone. I do not cower or simp. I'm not a good little girl now. Don't expect to see my hands folded neatly on my desk. Madison. Are most of us go do through most I of us? I think most of us go like, through it. And most you of hit probably, 40 and it kind of you say, wait a minute, what am I doing? Why am I not standing up for this person? I still regret that I didn't stand up for a kid named Richie in kindergarten because he was fat and his mother walked him to school and the kids made fun of him. They used to put things on his back and put tacks on his chair and chase him and all that stuff. And I didn't have the nerve to stand up for him. And I regret it to this day. Why is that? Where do we, I mean... Do we pick that up from our parents, uh, from our ethnicity, from our culture? No, I think it's, I mean, it's a real, I, I must be cross a lot of ethnic and racial and cultural lines because I have read all over the country and when I read about that, about that trying to get courage, learning courage, um, 
I, you get a tremendous response from people because they understand exactly what it is to shut up, to be afraid, to try to be protective. Uh, I'll say that when I've stood up sometimes for something that I really believed in, and believe me, it took me until I was 40 to have the nerve to do it. Uh, and I would be shaking after I did it. I mean, I would be like, <laughs> really terrified, but I did it. And the first time I did it, I was so proud of myself. I, I cannot tell you how proud of myself. I felt like I had finally found the courage that I'd been looking for my whole life, sort of like the cowardly lion in, in, the, in Dorothy, what is it? Wizard of, Wizard of Oz. Oz. And it was so wonderful to find that courage. It was so wonderful. It was such a liberating kind of thing to find it. And it's a nece it seems to me that it's part of, we can talk about religion and we can talk about spirituality and we can talk about searching for goodness and redemption and salvation. But I think if we're too chicken to stand up and protect other people, then we're as guilty as the people who are bothering them. So we have to, I, I really feel that so strongly and I think that for me to go up to somebody after and say gee I really agree with you but I didn't have the courage to say it which people said to me have said many times to me but I particularly think of one occasion recently um, they were protecting themselves they wanted to be asked back they wanted not to make waves they agreed with me but they weren't going to stand up and be counted and although I was upset at myself for standing up and being counted one part of me was really proud of me for standing up and being and, and being counted. So that's the, that's the kind of thing that uh, uh, that that I feel uh, is important. But I, I know we don't have a you. Uh, I guess I shouldn't mention time. But I would like to read a few more poems if I could. Is there time? Oh. Um, when when I was growing up. I never met my grandmother or great-grandmother. My parents came here when they were um, young adults and uh, they never had the money to go back to Italy and my grandparents didn't have the money to come to America. So I never met them and in, in essence I had to imagine what they were like and really all I knew was they didn't even have money to have a lot of pictures taken or anything so there were a few photographs of them they were blue airmail letters that went back and forth all the time my mother used to make a uh, package uh, packages to them and she would sew up she would put all these things into the package things they couldn't get in Italy uh, or were expensive in Italy uh, coffee and um, chocolate and material and things that she knew they wouldn't be able to buy and she would make these big packages and she would sew them together with um, she would make flour sack bags and put all the stuff in the flour sack bags and then sew up the bag and then put um, something that was like wax like a wax sealant all around the edges so it wouldn't break and they would mail them off and she would do three or four about every month or so they would send off three or four of these packages uh, to Italy. My father really believing in my mother that they had a responsibility to try to uh, make the lives of the people they had left behind a little better. So that was what I really knew about them. In a way what I learned from my mother and father was how to not to hang on to things tightly, not to, not to, to, to give things away um, easily to, I mean, I haven't done it in the same way my mother has done it. I, she did it with food. I guess I try to do it with poetry. But that idea of the more you try to hang on to something, the more you lose, and the more you give away, the more you have. Um, and I see that as a kind of continuity between myself and my grandparents and, um, and my children. Anyway, this is called I Dream of My Grandmother and Great Grandmother. I imagine them walking down rocky paths toward me, strong Italian women returning at dusk from fields where they worked all day on farms built like steps up the sides of steep mountains, graceful women carrying water in terracotta jugs on their heads. What I know of these women whom I never met, <coughs> forgive me, what I know of these women whom I never met I know from my mother a few pictures of my grandmother standing at the doorway of the Fieldstone house in San Mauro, the stories my mother told of them. 
but I know them most of all from watching my mother, her strong arms lifting sheets out of the cold water in the ringer washer, or from the way she stepped back, wiping her hands on her homemade flour sack apron and admired her jars of canned peaches that glowed like amber in the dim cellar light. I see those women in my mother as she worked, grinning and happy in her garden that spilled its bounty into her arms. She gave away baskets of peppers, lettuce, eggplant, bowls of pasta, meatballs, zeppoli, loaves of homemade bread. It was a miracle, she said. The more I gave away, the more I had to give. Now I see her in my daughter. That same unending energy, that quick mind, that hand open and extended to the world. When I watch my daughter clean the kitchen counter, watch her turn, laughing, I remember my mother as she lay dying, how she said of my daughter, that Jennifer, she's all the treasure you'll ever need. I turn now as my daughter turns and see my mother walking toward us down crooked mountain paths. Behind her, all those women dressed in black. And I'd like to read a poem which really deals directly with my father and Patterson and is very much set in Patterson. Daddy, we called you. Daddy, we called you daddy when we talked to each other in the street, pulling on our American faces, shaping our lives in Patterson slang. Inside our house, we spoke a southern Italian dialect mixed with English, and we called you Papa, but outside again you became Daddy, and we spoke of you to our friends as my father, imagining we were speaking of that Father Knows Best TV character in his dark business suit, carrying his briefcase into his house, retreating to his panel den his big living room and dining room, his frilly aproned wife who greeted him at the door with a kiss. Such space and silence in that house. We lived in one big room, living room, dining room, kitchen, bedroom, all in one, dominated by the great oak dining table around which we sat, talking and laughing, listening to your stories, your political arguments with your friends. Papa, how you glowed in company light, happy when the other immigrants came to you for help with their taxes or legal papers. It was only outside that glowing circle that I denied you, denied your long hours as night watchman in Royal Machine Shop. One night, riding home from a date, my middle-class American boyfriend kissed me at the light. I looked up and met your eyes as you stood at the corner near Royal Machine. It was nearly midnight, January, cold and windy. You were waiting for the bus, the street light illuminating your face. I pretended I did not see you. Let my boyfriend pull away, leaving you on the empty corner, waiting for the bus to take you home. You never mentioned it, never said that you knew how often I lied about what you did for a living or that I was ashamed to have my boyfriend see you, find out about your second shift work, your broken English. Today, remembering that mo moment, still illuminated in my mind by the street lamp's gray light, I think of my own son and the distance between us greater than miles. Papa, silk worker, janitor, night watchman, immigrant Italian. I honor the years you spent in menial work, slipping down the ladder as your body failed you while your mind so quick and sharp longed to escape. Honor the times you got out of bed after sleeping only an hour to take me to school or pick me up. The warm bakery rolls you bought for me on the way home from the night shift, the letters you wrote to the editors of local newspapers. Papa, silk worker, janitor, night watchman, immigrant Italian, better than any father knows best father, bland as white rice. With your wine press in the cellar, with the newspapers you collected out of garbage piles to turn into money you banged for us. With your mouse traps, with your cracked and calloused hands, with your yellowed teeth. Papa, dragging your dead leg through the factories of Patterson. I am outside the house now, shouting your name.
we're about wrapping it up now. Is there anything that you'd like to say? Um, <clears throat> we have a pretty decent conversation in, in readings today. That, uh, but is there anything that you'd like to close with? Anything that you'd um, like to say about poetry or about yourself or about family or whatever? They're also, they're, they're also part of one thing for me. They may not be true for, for some other writers, but it's certainly true for me. Um, they, they, my poems and my writing in general is rooted in um, the past, in memory, in place. Patterson is really a very, very important part of that. And, you know, I could, could I just read a poem about, um, the, about Passaic County College? Can I do that? Is there time? Okay. Um, anyway, this is called The Great Escape, and I, I'm reading it because they, we've, been have, been, we've been having a number of people from the Army, Navy, and Air Force trying to come here to recruit our students. The Great Escapes. The Great Escape. The recruiters for the Army, Navy, Air Force sit behind plain wooden tables covered with leaflets on the service, an officer pictured, bright-eyed and clean, all his brass buttons shining. The recruiters, white and clean-shaven, their close-cropped light hair, their eyes blue as marbles, stand out in this lobby at Passaic County College in Patterson, New Jersey, filled with young, black-brown skin and voices in ghetto slang laughing, and Puerto Rican women in elastic day-glow pants, and slender Latino men with clipped mustaches and dapper smiles. Out of the crowd of moving, circulating students, first Juan Garcia, then Kevin Clark, drifts over to the recruiters. I hear the sales pitch on how the service gives you a chance to learn a trade, to have a career, and when you get out, they even give you a scholarship to college. Kevin's face turns hopeful, the path to a better life opening in his mind like a highway out of the city and the only life he's known. And Juan listens too, and he too believes. They drift back to the group, others replace them. All day the recruiters talk and talk, till finally at nightfall, Jose Jimenez, Kimmy Freeman, George McKay, Keisha Lynette return to the tables, sign their names to long, complicated forms that they don't comprehend, the path out of the city smooth as greased metal. After Broadway, after the Alexander Hamilton Welfare Hotel, after the graffiti on the walls, after the pimp strutting his four women, after the garbage in the gutters, after the screaming women, after this offer, this brass buttons on the suit of the Army Lieutenant, his polished shoes, and the Air Force Corporal, sharp in her blue uniform and neat shining hair, seemed to hold out golden keys to Jose Jimenez, Kimmy Freeman, George McKay, Keisha Lynette, that they hope will set them free. On TV, 10 days after the outbreak of the war, the cameraman takes a picture of some young people waiting in Saudi Arabia for the fighting to begin. The camera scans the untried, untouched faces of the soldiers. We've been waiting so long, Mason Brown says. I just wanted to start, meaning the fighting the tanks massing at the border, the ground troops wait, waiting. This is where I want to be, he says. I just felt a need to get that in. And uh, I, wanted, I wanted to end with a really short poem, which was in the Christian Science Monitor, um, which is more, deals more with, I do love this city. I mean, I love the people in it. I love, um, I love Passaic County College because it's so diverse, because there are people from so many places carting their hopes here and, and finding in this college, some of them, a kind of salvation, finding a way to get out, a way to rise economically, a way to open up their lives. And when you meet a student like that who has had a very difficult life, and many, many people have had very difficult lives who live here and who come to school here, who in reading a book, just as I did, in reading a book they find something opening for them or meeting the right teacher or hearing the exact right words as the exact moment in their lives, they find something happening for them. And for me, I, I mean, I really even like the landscape of the city. Um, 
and and I'm not blind to the things that are wrong and the and the difficulties of people's lives here but there is also beauty here and there is beauty in the faces of some of the people in fact many of the people and a kind of dignity that I wish some of our politicians could get a look at this poem is called the river at dusk late afternoon I drive past the Bunker Hill factories over the new steel girders of the 6th Avenue Bridge. Through the glossy silver webwork, I glimpse the river curving toward downtown Patterson, the trees over it stark as burnt matches against the darkening sky. How beautiful the city is at this hour. People caught in glass and metal drive toward lamplight, the rush rough brush strokes of factories in the background. The river, peaceful and slow, moves as it has always moved. And at dusk, the rising moon, like a lucite dipper, lifts the dark water into a momentary, exquisite light. <laughs>